Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, here with part two of the first ever two-part conversation episode, just because there was so much to say, and I learned so much, and I say that every time, but in this case, I learned two episodes worth, (laughs) so it's really saying something. This is part two of my episode, Conversation with Kyle Lewis Jordan, all about Hephaestus. Hephaestus as a character, Hephaestus within and beyond the confines of Greek mythology, Hephaestus and his relationship with Athena, Hephaestus and reception of Greek myth in modern so-called modern, you know, the last few hundred years sourcing, and then also popular culture of today. So much about Hephaestus, all also like in and around the realm of his impairment and disability within the Olympians and all of that. So fascinating. I'm just so thrilled that Kyle had the time to talk to me for this long that we got so much into these episodes that I now have this episode that came out on Tuesday all about Hephaestus as a character. You know, the things I had kind of missed in my mentions of him in the past. And now, you know, I'm able to see this whole new world. Anyway, now one thing I realized after editing the episode with Kyle is that I didn't ask him to share where you all can and should follow him on the internet. So I would highly recommend that you follow Kyle on Twitter, where his handle is the very Egyptian, at Horus of Nekhen, that's H-O-R-U-S-O-F-N-E-K-H-E-N, where he says you can follow him for all sorts of other exciting disability in antiquity and Egyptology-related content. Also, I have put two links in the description of this episode where you can watch a couple of the talks that he has done on disability in Egyptian mythology and just Egyptology in general. There really is so much to learn and there are such cool people doing the work on it. This is so much fun for me. Such a thrill. I can't wait for you to hear the rest of this episode. And so without any further ado... Conversations, sing muses of Hephaestus, famed for inventions, with Kyle Lewis Jordan, Part 2. In terms of his relationships with other kids, I think actually his relationship with Athena is probably the most interesting mm-hmm. because the two are essentially, you know, in a manner of speaking, the two are inseparable. If, the, mm-hmm. if, the, if, if one is doing something, the other is often not too far behind in some way mm-hmm. or fashion. The two work together quite a lot from what I've read, at least, or from what I've seen. And obviously the two cults in the, in the actual physical world are very closely um, entwined obviously at Athens you have the Acropolis and you have Athena's temple but not too far away from that you have uh, the temple of Hephaestus as well Mm -hmm. and there is actually um, I don't know what the right word is because obviously the the gods depending on location had different epithets but uh, Mm -hmm. there is one epithet Mm -hmm. of Athena which is Athena Hephaestia I think is the is the the, which is the which is basically the partnership of the two not in any way obviously a romantic one but it, instead no, it's no. like it because she is is the cunning uh, kind of goddess of industry and he is obviously the craftsman so the two go hand in hand and obviously their their relationship in terms of as far as the myths go again if we go back and we accept the variation of the myth where where Hephaestus conked Zeus on the head and out came mm-hmm. Athena Which is one the, of my favorites yeah I think it's <laughs> just the image the image of my head like I said earlier I just love it uh, but yeah the idea of obviously Athena springs forth and there they are and again on the Parthenon freeze like I mentioned earlier where he has his crutch who's he speaking to he's speaking mm-hmm. to Athena because the two just 
seem to have this have this like near constant relationship because of how close their natures are and i think obviously for afina that is that is just its complement to her kind of wider thinking this kind of scope that she can obviously see that this is this is a relationship that's beneficial to her especially Mm -hmm. complete connection there he's the craftsman god and she's a god of like the womanly crafts Mm -hmm. which is her only sort of explicitly feminine attribute um Mm -hmm. to an otherwise fairly you know uh genderless god as Mm -hmm. um julie levy pointed out yeah that that you know other than than you know her her being athena being this this goddess of, of womanly crafts and and then her you know so-called birth and this will we will get into that with Hephaestus of of the Athenian people Mm -hmm. you know she she's otherwise fairly genderless but but they are have an explicit connection there um by Mm. both being these like two sides of of craftsmanship and of Mm. creation which I think is is kind of fascinating there yeah no absolutely and I think uh obviously the two have she she has gained a lot from obviously his craft he made her 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 fleece obviously is one of the one of the big things that comes up. One that even Zeus borrows on occasion, which I just her, yeah <laughs> I, I love. I just find hilarious just this idea of oh this looks good I'll take that and you know <laughs> the two work together there. They also help Her- Heracles in in mm-hmm. his labors. Um, it's the mm-hmm. sixth labor, the the birds, the the kind of harpies, oh, the Stymphalian birds, Stymphalian yeah. birds. Yeah, they they work together to to basically help him do that which is just a cool little tale i think yeah and there's just so much you can take away from it especially because obviously as you mentioned uh what often gets focused on is his attempted rape Mm -hmm. essentially of of athena and how she basically is like not having none of that yeah and uh, basically dispatches him quite handily and he quickly scurries away just to connect because i think this is important as much as it is you know it's a bad it it is an attempted attempted rape but in her dispatching him just like kind of tossing him to the side he ejaculates on the ground yes, and thus are born the athenian people which connects them both to hephaestus and to athena mm. which i think it makes that deeper connection of like and mm. the, you know the the athenians wouldn't have they i don't think that it was you know and maybe it was different because it's hephaestus but you know obviously their connection to um assault was very different they did understand assault mm. but i think in that case it wasn't seen as anything traumatic it was mm. more of that like Athena is, you know, not a god who has sex, but in order for the two to make the Athenian people, that is how it had to happen. Yeah. And so I, I think they saw it more as that kind of, it was kind of like, yeah, uh, you know, a parentage without them having to have sex because that would have <laughs> with their idea of yes. Athena, which I think is quite interesting. And, and it, it it also takes a little bit of the the onus off of Hephaestus as much as we don't want to from a modern perspective. Yeah. But when it comes to them, it was that major connection of of you know he he also was a sort of unofficial parent mm. to the to the athenians which is important mm-hmm. it is important and i think i think also obviously there is there is worth bearing in mind that the olympians are of course not human they they mm-hmm. have a very different relationship with trauma and so yeah. in, in in athena's case i think the reason that she just kind of essentially like you said she throws them off the athenians are born and at that point i think she's more interested in them than what happened because she's exactly yeah she's it's not a big deal to her at all yeah i think that is also partly because like you said they they share this bond in both being craftsmen gods um and in that way she is far too cunning to dispatch of the fact that the two actually work quite well together Mm -hmm. so in her mind i don't think she would see it as beneficial to just to kind of relegate him all of a sudden Mm -hmm. especially because fundamentally from an olympian point of view you guys are going to be together for essentially eternity there's no point in 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 holding a grudge but of course that is important to bear in mind that is why that happens because they are olympians so that's obviously there is there are no human takeaways there that's not like you know i would not expect anyone else to react the same way but that's just (laughs) the nature the nature of the thing and it's always worth bearing in mind but yeah i think what i would always be interested in going back to this modern retelling i would be far more interested in seeing a modern exploration of their their relationship i think and i think for one, I would still include that origin story of the Athenians. I would not mm-hmm. want to get rid of that. I think it's important that it stays that it stays that way. And I think you could explore that relationship because I do think it is fair to say that is that is in some way an unrequited love because he is he is very much enamored with her. 
he they would make a good couple like i can yeah. you know if athena were of the type to want to be in a couple mm. like i mean certainly i think those two would be would have been ideal so i can see it does have a kind of feeling to it doesn't it mm-hmm. uh, i do think mm-hmm. i do think the two have a bond of a kind i just don't think mm-hmm. it's obviously a romantic one because again that just doesn't fit for a, for athena not really mm-hmm. at least not in the kind of the way that um we think of say aries and aphrodite it wouldn't it mm-hmm. would in no way be the same i think the two find their their bond through their craft and i like Mm -hmm. to think of i would love to see a story where like athena just brings him metals to work like you know just just literally leaves him metals and he just like oh yay more metal and you know (laughs) he goes and makes another automaton or something and she's just like oh that's nice or you know the two the two team up to beat up a giant or something i don't know like Mm -hmm. (laughs) just anything you could there is so there is so much to that relationship that you could explore and it's also a very interesting way in which you could explore this modern ideas about eye relationships and be his nature as a disabled god i think that more so than the than than his than his marriage with aphrodite because that is so complicated and multi-layered in a way that it would be difficult i think to do either side justice agreed yeah because of course like i said earlier i don't think i i don't judge aphrodite in like saying oh how dare she do that because again this Mm -hmm. was not a marriage that she that she consented to Mm -hmm. and she's the goddess of love and and all the rest of it but again it makes it complicated on the other side because again of the lack of agency and and all the rest of it but i think with Mm -hmm. athena and 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 the festus you have a much more equal partnership which could very much explore that idea of like them kind of exploring those boundaries together and eventually in the aftermath of the athenians being born the two of them just saying like all right look we have children now i guess uh i guess we have a responsibility to uphold and so the two of them just kind of agree this is just how we are going to be uh kind of work together from now on and i think that could be done in a way where both of them kind of walk away kind of happy with the with the, with the circumstances ha- as happy as olympians can be i guess but i do think it would be a very interesting story to tell with the modern lens i think there are so many layers of that that you can unpick and it also fundamentally it would be a great way to again dispel this quasimodoing of hephaestus you could actually show him as this again equal partner he's not I would hate to see, this is another reason why I would never want to see much picking apart of Aphrodite and Hephaestus, because that's far too easy to do Beauty and the Beast, mm-hmm. which is just one oh, thing. Oh, that's so true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which uh, disability in, in myth, but also folklore, far too often gets connotated with with uh, beast beastliness. I mean, yeah, even monstrosity. in... Mm-hmm. Monstrosity. Even in... In the Greek myth, for instance, uh, one one other aspect of Hephaestus' nature that we didn't address earlier is that he sweats. And he's mm. the only god that's really described as sweating, apart from, funnily enough, his mother. Uh, Hera gets described as sweating once in the in the Iliad. I think it's when it's around the time where the gods decide to get involved, like full on, and she's starting to mess with Troy. I think she sweats under the labor of of what she's doing. I can't remember what. I'm sorry. It's been a very long time no, since I've read it in so- full. I mean, I didn't even know that they that we had that. That's fascinating that connection. Yeah, but um, he sweats like a, like an animal, uh, which is just not in any other way that you would ever see an Olympian described. In the same way, like you think of satyrs, for instance, how they are mm-hmm. most often uh, kind of I- illustrated and imagined as as essentially people with dwarfism, and how mm-hmm. they are just intimately connected with the with the animal kingdom and this kind of bestial nature. They're not really human, which is very different from say the near east where Mm -hmm. people with dwarfism are round about especially in egypt's case very highly regarded i mean Mm. people often like to point out Bess, the 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 dwarf uh god of of Mm. protection in the household but it's worth bearing in mind that Bess doesn't really appear until much later in terms of egyptian time span like end of the middle kingdom start of the new kingdom so even in the old kingdom like going well even further than that the pre-dynastic you have um people with dwarfism appearing in the pharaonic court which is something that i study and and things like that um so bodily difference in other parts of the world is taken very differently but in greece um especially things like uh dwarfism but also gigantism which is obviously uh, an opposite Mm -hmm. um they, they just get kind of imbued with all this kind of bestial nature which is which is um, interesting. So again, kind of going off on the tangent there. Sorry. No, it's fascinating. I've never, I've never made that connection. To mm. uh, to me, there's so many creatures that are so 
fantastical mm. um, that I've never thought to make that connection. So I think it is it is really fascinating because mm-hmm. to me it's always satyr. I've always connected satyrs with like centaurs, where or like mm. you know just like just completely completely fictional fantastical characters and and therefore like unhuman but not in any mm-hmm. kind of way like that that's really interesting mm-hmm. and and certainly makes sense to to that 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 sort of the yeah the connection and therefore like a yeah the the comparison to egypt is, is yeah. quite interesting that's again why i would kind of be apprehensive of of doing an aphrodite Hephaestus mm-hmm. story mm-hmm. at least at least to start with i think it could be done but it would take a lot of unpacking and i think an easier start would be looking at his relationship with athena instead mm-hmm. especially because i think from athena's point of view um she she looks at him as far more than the equal than i think most mm-hmm. of most of his peers do with the exception of a few he does have good relationships with again like i said prometheus is one mm-hmm. helios is another uh, mm-hmm. actually in the story oh, yeah, obviously of is. aphrodite and, and Ares, it is helios who kind of alerts him to the to the realities mm-hmm of um that i actually and then spies for him later yeah and spies for him later yeah uh, that's again because everyone is in, in this odd way they are indebted to hephaestus mm-hmm. because of the things that he makes for them obviously hermes and his sandals athena and his fleece uh helios and his chariot like there's mm-hmm. there's so much that that they owe him and so they are wary of that they are mindful of 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 this debt that they have but obviously some kind of navigate it in a slightly different way to others but in mm-hmm. cases of like Helios and, and Athena as well, I think Athena mm-hmm. takes it as a sign of friendship in a way, mm-hmm. I think. And and again, just because of their natures. And so I think you could tell a very equal kind of story and you could explore their their kind of their natures respectively through that and and could really do do it justice, I think, in a way that I really think disabled uh, representations in myth and folklore deserve to be told because mm-hmm. Far too often it is, again, linked with this kind of monstrosity and things. And that's kind of always what errs me on the side of caution whenever people do have this kind of uh, overly negative reaction to Hephaestus. I can completely understand it. Again, don't get Mm -hmm. me wrong, but it's like I would. It does worry me because, I mean, again, I am a disabled man and Mm -hmm. and I've been in positions where people do have these sort of reactions to me for odd reasons. And it's just it puts you in a very uncomfortable position. And I think a lot of disabled people who are interested in the ancient and classical world and they look at figures like Hephaestus, they do feel a certain kind of understanding with with the god because he is someone, at least from our modern perceptions of him, who, who, who you know, we can, we can appreciate that frustration, that anger, even yeah. if he kind of obviously takes it to an extreme that, you know, even I would be like, all right, dude, calm the fuck down. Yeah, <laughs> maybe a bit much. <laughs> maybe a bit much, yeah. yeah. Like, there's no need for slut shaming now. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's it's just, if anyone who is listening who likes to do these modern modern retellings, because I've seen, because mm-hmm. I, I saw you tweet a while back and you had these, uh, you were asking people about art uh, who did mm. art, and I saw this lovely um, comic. I can't remember the name. I am so sorry if they're mm. listening. Um but someone posted this lovely comic and that actually showed Hephaestus. And it was like, so my name's Hephaestus and this is my wife, Aphrodite, and her boyfriend, Ares. And, and that was interesting. <laughs> um, like yeah, but um, it was pretty cool because he was in a wheelchair too. He looked pretty, he looked pretty mm. neat. Although, um, and this is not a criticism of the artist, just to be clear, it, mm-hmm. it, it did strike me that, the, that Hephaestus was depicted as, as kind of orcish, I guess I would descri- describe mm. him character. And I, I have no doubt that the artist had no ill intentions in that regard. But again, it is, it is telling that disability is often paired with monstrosity, even if it's intended not to be ill. It's, it, it, it often happens that way. So I would mm-hmm. like to see a presentation of Hephaestus that doesn't do that, that tries mm-hmm. to show that he is literally an Olympian by all accounts, except in the way that he is treated. And mm-hmm. by that nature, that is how he is disabled. And again, mm-hmm. I think you could explore that through his partnership with Athena and therefore by proxy his the other gods by comparison. I have so many incredible thoughts based on on all of this. So for one, I think, uh, so just thinking about Hephaestus in this way and, and his relationship with Aphrodite, um, you know, based on kind of everything you've you've brought up and just sort of, you know, not not absolving him at all, but but re, you know, just looking at it from this different lens. Um, I think it, I think something that um, that I have personally overlooked, and again, I, I'll admit to fully, you know, not ever giving Hephaestus his due, but I think that you can see his uh, marriage to Aphrodite as not only being non-consensual on her part, but on his as well, because 
while I think the assumption and the like the way we're sort of conditioned to think about it is that like obviously he would want to marry her because she's this uh, beautiful goddess of love and beauty but ultimately their marriage comes about via you know his entrapping Hera Mm. in this golden throne so you know to the the reminder about it he he entraps Mm. Hera in this golden throne they're all trying to free her and and you know Zeus basically promises gross promises marriage to Aphrodite to whoever can free Hera Mm. and and Ares fails and thus doesn't marry her and then I forget who it is it's probably Poseidon because he's such a gross god (laughs) um like I think it's Poseidon who who goes to Hephaestus Mm. and is like hey you know if you just let Hera go you know you can marry Aphrodite and so I think because of that it's sort of taken as if as if Hephaestus is like oh yeah hell yeah you know I'll marry this woman against Mm. her will just by freeing this person that Mm. I entrapped in the first place but I think if you ultimately turn it around and look at it that Hephaestus's role with the Olympians and his, you know, his treatment was such that he was coerced or felt like he had to free Hera and thus was ultimately forced to marry Aphrodite. Like not necessarily that he was like, oh yeah, you will do it because mm-hmm. I get to marry Aphrodite. But as if he freed her, you know, either because he changed his mind or because he was convinced or because they held it against him and, and he knew that his life would be easier if he did, but ultimately was led to marry Aphrodite, even though she didn't love him. And then you have all of these things because I also think, and this, you know, is not super important, but I think it, it's a side note that adds to everything is that my my standpoint is that Aphrodite and Ares are the only representations of actual love amongst the mm. Olympians, romantic love. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see another example of that that is like a mutual ultimate romantic love with gods like that. And so I think that, you know, Hephaestus getting stuck with Aphrodite is equally bad for him, like, mm. You know, he he would, I'm sure, would love a wife who loves him. But here he's forced to marry this woman who doesn't love him at all. He doesn't love her. Like, so many things can be read into that. But I think ultimately they are, you know, based on both his disability and the patriarchy. It's assumed that he would just want to marry Aphrodite because she's gorgeous. You know, this like, well, she's a beautiful woman. So obviously Mm. he wants her. Like, that, that level of... You know, it it, it it says a lot about women and people with mm. disability, this connection with like the way that, you know, ultimately everything was determined by these like, you know, able bodied mm. men, you know. And so I think that's quite interesting to look at it that way as well. And, and it it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't absolve him of, of what mm. he does, but it does make it a little bit more. It, like you can kind of you can see a little bit more where he's coming from yeah. and, and it makes it a little bit like the anger, I think, more comes from, you know, his situation versus like this kind of inherent and not situation based on his disability but based on his like mm. life with with Aphrodite that would probably yeah. suck <laughs> right yeah. like and, and so I think it's it's just an interesting like extra level to to look at it when it comes to him absolutely I, I, I like a lot of what you said and uh I think um from my retelling it's Dionysus who who goes down oh and the, you're like, right yeah, it's Dionysus it's Dionysus because he gets him drunk yeah. and he brings him back up on an ass <laughs> which is all, also another aspect of the yeah. story if you did want to take that idea that he is technically for forced into this marriage as well he is imbued he is drunk he is not consensual mm-hmm. in this regard he is like he has literally been coerced into accepting yes. this marriage um so you could take it that way as well the way i always remembered the story was that actually he 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 kind of um freed hera and then he was kind of like and now you're married to aphrodite to which i think he's like what like because remember what he's asking for when he when he does that he just wants to be accepted as an olympian yeah. on his own terms that's what he's asking yeah. for and by his mother and like by his mother like a motherly acceptance yeah. and olympian yeah. acceptance and, yeah. what, and what he gets is like not what he wants and it's the same story with the with what happens with aphrodite Ares, and and him he goes mm-hmm. expecting his dowry back and he doesn't even get that he gets Poseidon offering to pay the dowry which is not the same thing it's not the same it's not, no it's not the i mean remember these are gods he doesn't care about financial implications mm-hmm. it's, it's it that's irrelevant to him especially as a crafting god he can make whatever yeah. he pleases yeah. <laughs> it's for him i think it's the acceptance of of who mm-hmm. he is and what he is and that he is as deserving of the status of his kin than anything else but he's denied that again and again mm-hmm. and again and that is what i think torments him and therefore mm-hmm. subsequently makes him this very very angry and and sometimes very violent kind of god and again that does not absolve him of the of the nasty mm-hmm. things that he does you know i'm not 
I'm not saying that he was right to do what he did to Aphrodite mm-hmm. or anything like that, but it, it, it does show, again, it goes back to what I said a lot earlier, it shows the desperation that he felt that was what he felt he had to do, in the same mm-hmm. way that he felt he had to buy his way into Olympus by effectively threatening them and being like, you know, let me in or else. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's that just defines their relationship. And I think with Aphrodite and Hephaestus, this kind of comes back to what I was saying at the very beginning when, when I mentioned how in modern interpretations he does get Quasimodo. And I do think this is sometimes paralleled with, with or, or because of, reflected upon his relationship with Aphrodite, the idea of Quasimodo it actually comes from... I saw this image recently. Um, I can't tell you where it was from. I'm not sure of the exact kind of context, but it was an image that supposedly shows Hephaestus and Aphrodite, and what it shows is is Hephaestus has his has his uh, club foot, but he also has a hunchback. He also has this mm. disfigured face, and he has all these like wonderful gifts in his arms, and he's essentially chasing. It looks like he's chasing like Aphro- Aphrodite, who's running from him, and is like, you know, oh, get away from me! I don't want those gifts. And that like, I did have this conversation once with someone, and they were and they were saying, you know, oh, uh, you know, to me, Aphrodite and Hephaestus is a case of unrequited love. And and I understand why, because from some retellings, that's obviously how it might come across. But to me, mm-hmm. I, I I kind of can't agree with that because like mm-hmm. that always just like I mean maybe always an exaggeration, but for by far and away, too often when a disabled person wants to get into a relationship, t- far too often the public perception is oh it's always going to be unrequited love, because mm-hmm. the underlying assumption is who would ever. Who would ever love love mm-hmm. love a disabled person? And I mean, you, you get this today with very happy couples who, you know, one partner may be disabled, and you hear these stories of people who approach them and you know approach the, especially if it's a female partner who's non-disabled. It, it mm. seems to be if a female partner, you know, is is in a, in a relationship with a disabled man, it seems. To, but I'm sure it, there are there are uh, observations of the reverse. Just to be clear, mm-hmm. but it mm-hmm. does seem to happen a lot the other way around. They'll go up to them and they'll say, oh, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. It's like sorry for what like you know it's like all these things like with Hephaestus and um Aphrodite I think that that modern perception that very recent modern perception has been implanted on that and Mm -hmm. I think more so in reality I think that both of them are just fed up (laughs) being in the situation I think that's absolutely neither of them are are kind of happy and so therefore Mm -hmm. in a way I would think perhaps his reaction Hephaestus's reaction to to the cuckolding is less so that he's annoyed with, uh, he's like shocked that Aphrodite has mm-hmm. done this. Mm-hmm. He's just more annoyed by the fact that why on earth are we stuck in this if clearly I don't love her and she doesn't love me. She clearly wants to be with Ares. Yeah. Can we just be done with it? And every, I, I, like, obviously, this is my interpretation and my imagination at this point, but I like to imagine that this has been going on for a while. Hephaestus knows about it. Hephaestus actually doesn't care too much because, again, mm-hmm. he's also in, in relationships with her charities. So, you know, the mm-hmm. feeling is mutual. Um, but, <laughs> but he's probably gone to Zeus multiple times and said, you know, look, I'm not in love with your daughter. I don't want her. Can I have my dowry back? Mm-hmm. And Zeus has just been like, no. <laughs> like no mm-hmm. you can't and he's just been like oh i'm fed up with this and so he that's eventually the extreme that he goes to and again that doesn't make it right at all it makes no. it, it it makes it terrible and i'm sure mm-hmm. obviously when aphrodite um flees away out of shame uh at least mm-hmm. how, how that's translated mm-hmm. and she goes into hiding for a while obviously we never see the aftermath of these things too mm-hmm. that's important to bear in mind the story just kind mm-hmm. of ends it just ends, you could yeah. you could imagine either probably Hephaestus might have felt incredibly guilty afterwards he might have been like oh god I just kind of exploded like a volcano and caused all this <laughs> destruction and look mm-hmm. at what I did um but we don't know you could interpret it in many different ways but I think the way I would I would kind of want people to look at their relationship isn't this sort of unrequited love where it's mm-hmm. kind of like, oh, of course she would never love Hephaestus. It's not that I don't think she would ever love Hephaestus. They were just never, that, that relationship was never allowed to form of its own accord. It just kind of got put together. And that's why I think it never worked because you know, love just doesn't happen that way. So yeah. I, I, I would just ask people not to look at it that, like, like that because it then does lead to this insinuation that that's just how relationships with disabled people go, which is just really difficult, really difficult yeah, to say as a I... disabled person how that how that often does affect your relationships. Like, I mean, I, I don't want to get all soporific, and you, you're more than welcome to cut this out. If, uh, speaking as a disabled man, the amount of times that, you know, even the suggestion that I would be in a partnership with a certain person, and that person, by no ill will of their own, will just have a sudden very 
violent quote unquote reaction because the entire thought of it but then they'll realize and they'll come and apologize and like I don't I'm sorry I I reacted in that way I don't know why I did but it's so ingrained that people Mm -hmm. do just have this visceral reaction to the idea and it's just you know I I, I really wish we did start to just tell stories a little differently it's Mm -hmm. okay to have a relationship that doesn't work out and -hmm. that can include disabled people but it can't it don't don't bring it down to their disability or their embodiment because again in reality, I don't think it had anything to do with that. I think it just no. had to do with the fact that the two, by their very natures, were very different creatures, effectively, and would never have loved each other anyway, at least not in that way. No, I I, I think that's completely important, and I think true. Like, I, I mean, from a, from a textual standpoint of the sources, and I've read a lot of them, um, I don't think it's unrequited at all. I think it's 100% just like, he's mad at the situation. You know, it, it, it's not a good situation. He, yeah. it makes him look bad, and you know, whatever you want to say about that, but that's more that's more to do with the the way it's written and who tells the stories again. But I don't think it's meant to suggest that it, that he's like obsessively in love with her and, and she doesn't love him back. Um, and I do think, yeah, that 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 comes in later as, as these interpretations of it. But in the in the sourcing, it it really isn't there. You mm. know, he he marries her because of the situation with Hera and because of Zeus. There also is some sourcing i believe though i can't think of what it would be necessarily um mm. that suggests that the, their marriage comes about more directly through the machinations of zeus mm. uh and just him wanting aphrodite like quote unquote off the market mm. uh, with a man like hephaestus which i think yeah. is a you know that's that again mm. is the suggestion of you know taking you know the effects on his mm-hmm. him as a person and his agency completely and it, it is more suggestive of you know just how shitty zeus is as we all know but i also think you know and in, in connecting to that like we get this idea that hephaestus is angry that he does all these things to to aphrodite and again like they are bad but they they are based on who's telling the stories and the stories and yet we never get a judgment on what zeus does mm-hmm. you know and it's yeah. so interesting that because yeah. Zeus does a million things worse than Hephaestus. <laughs> is um, yeah. like so many more things that are worse and so yeah this idea that there is this judgment involved with with Hephaestus is interesting and and obviously you know like probably based in in his mm. his disability again we have to look at his relationships in the broader context of what the other olympians are doing and and obviously mm-hmm. Zeus has his own motives as he always does you you can't you can't look at any of the gods without considering their relationship with the others the olympians are a total <laughs> a total package you gotta you gotta take the whole mm-hmm. subscription or none at all i think Reflecting back on what I said about um, the the kind of association with beastliness and this mm-hmm. sort of thing, because beasts, obviously in particular, animals that sweat. So you're thinking of asses, of horses, of things, pack pack animals, basically. Mm. Pack animals often associated as well with slaves, slaves mm. taken from mm-hmm. war. Hephaestus, obviously, I think it would be a stretch to say that he is in any way associated with with slaves. That would be far too much of a kind of stretch, but. Mm. I would say it is an interesting kind of thing to think about how he labors away in the forge to do all these mm-hmm. things for the Olympians in the same way that this, these are societies that, ex- that extract great amounts of labor from bodies mm-hmm. of people that they have conquered or st- stolen or bought from elsewhere in the world. And that often gets erased whenever we think about their stories or their cultures or their achievements, you know. You Mm -hmm. must, you must critically, if you ever want to study the classical world, you must consider slavery in Mm -hmm. in every aspect. You really must, Mm -hmm. because it is foundational to everything that they did. Um, And in 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 that sense, when you think of labors, when whenever you see labor discussed or talked about, you're not thinking of workmen as we do today. You're thinking of slaves. Mm -hmm. Um, And in in that way, you know, Hephaestus sweating and toiling away, huffing and puffing like he does in the in the in in the beginning of the Iliad when Mm -hmm. he's toing and throwing with the drinks. You know, it's never explicitly stated. And again, I think it would be far too much of a stretch to say he's treated like a slave. He's nowhere Mm -hmm. close to that. But Mm -hmm. it is interesting to look at the conflation between the disabled body 
and slavery because mm-hmm. that slavery by its very nature is a very violent act uh does disable disability is not just something that you are born with it is something mm-hmm. that you often are transformed into it's the body is malleable it changes and it can change under a lot of stress and a lot of trauma and mm-hmm. slavery is key to that and especially for the romans i can say the greeks less so but the romans had this odd fascination with disabled slaves they mm-hmm. they you know you you have um market advertisements asking for deaf or even uh, i think deaf slaves were quite popular because of course they can't hear you so they oh, you know gosh. you can you, you they won't they won't basically be brought out to spy on you or what have you i don't know yeah. um yeah. there's stuff like that so but also like they loved they loved having slaves with any sort of physical sort of difference to them because they and they, these people are collectible. So again, this mm-hmm. is something else to bear in mind when you're looking at disability in the ancient world, especially Greece and Rome is mm-hmm. is this association with things. And, and that, again, ties in with that beastliness. And I think while, again, Hephaestus, I wouldn't call him a slave by any means, Mm-mm. his labours and the, and the toll that takes on him are, are something worth bearing in mind when we think about embodiments and 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 how that manifests and how he manages that because he clearly has the capacity to manage it he makes these automatons and all these things to aid him if he's allowed to use them Mm -hmm. that makes his job hell of a lot easier but when the olympians deny him that it obviously makes it 10 times worse fundamentally what my my overall taking away point from this is not just about Mm -hmm. hephaestus it's that if you can see it on this mythological level if, if it exists on on this um, kind of theological level or whatever you want to call it, then clearly it goes deeper than that. If these gods are a reflection of the inner natures of humanity to what extent or another, mm-hmm. then I think as well, his the decision to have him embody this says something more than I think it's ever been given credit for until maybe very mm-hmm. re- recently. So again, just bear that in mind. His, his relationship with sweating, his relationship with anger all these things and his relationship with the other Olympians and how that's supposed to model in certain respects, this kind of ideal of, of how society should ex- exist, or at least how, how elite society should exist. Cause that's the other thing to bear in mind again, how, how these stories were produced for whom and by whom. Um, and, and that's the other thing. We don't see the variations that would have been had amongst everyday Greek people or everyday Roman people where attitudes would have been fairly different. For sure, Mm -hmm. but we just never know, and we will never know. But we do have ourselves to to reflect on and to interpret these stories. So all those interpretations we discussed about Aphrodite and Hephaestus or Athena and Hephaestus, you know, people are like, oh, but they're straying from the original myth. It's like, well, actually, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think there ever was really an original myth. A lot of these myths started from oral traditions, which just Mm -hmm. manifested and changed in very different ways. And that's just the nature of humans. We are a storytelling creature by by nature. So yeah, Mm -hmm. it's it's just again. So basically, I hope this discussion about Hephaestus and and his very complex nature gets you to reflect on how much deeper, the further you go, how much it permeates throughout these societies. Because it isn't just there by accident. It isn't just there for aesthetic. It's, It's much deeper than that. For the benefit of your viewers, if you do put this bit in, mm-hmm. um, I gave a Please. talk uh, very recently at the Allard Pearson, which is the uh, university collection of the uh, the museum collection of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, we were looking at disability in antiquity, and I gave a talk on an 18th century BCE Egyptian woman uh, called Geheset, which means gazelle, and she is the earliest known case mm. of a woman with cerebral palsy in the ancient world. Cerebral palsy is the condition that I have. Um, so I spoke about her and tried to kind of, as a disabled scholar, give the sense of not looking at disabled people in the ancient world as just embodying their disability alone, or as if, if, as if everything happens either because of or in spite of their disability. Mm-hmm. It is everything else that goes along with that, that pairs along with that, that gives you a sense of what the reality was. And again, it's not a black and white thing. And I think, again, the same is true for Hephaestus in the mythological sense. Mm-hmm. I hope what this this chat has discovered either across one episode or two however it gets cut um (laughs) is um is is that it is very multifaceted and it does play a role it is significant i don't think you should erase Mm -hmm. it but also it isn't the only thing that's going on here there's much more going on Mm -hmm. and this is true of almost every facet the the ancient world is no less complex than the modern one 
because often mm-hmm. we far too often in i'm going off on a completely different tangent in terms of how how we think about story things. of everything it's, it's my podcast yeah but ahead. it's um <laughs> far too often because we want to obviously distance ourselves from the ancient world just because of span of time and everything else we want to mm-hmm. make ourselves obviously look forward and 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 progressive and and different in thought when actually like we said earlier the the ancient greeks had a concept of violence against women they knew what rape was they knew what these things were obviously you could you it is not incorrect to say that women were unfortunately very very much oppressed in in those situations but that does not mean that they themselves were not conscious of that and did not think about that we often too often we we kind of make the past look dead like it's static like it didn't have emotion Mm -hmm. of its own like it didn't have conscious thought of its own and obviously that's partly because we can never hope to embody it fully but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try um and in in that sense in that case obviously from the example of speaking about disability in the ancient world like i can only hope that by being a disabled scholar i can help at least open some doors to at least understand what it's like to live in a disabled body i can never speak to anyone's embodiment in the ancient world fully because obviously there are just some things we will never really truly know but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try and if we accept Mm -hmm. as well that obviously we are always going to be coming in with a modern reception in mind then then we understand that as well often too often in in disability and antiquity studies scholars will say oh the concept of disability did not exist because there wasn't an overarching word or or there wasn't a, like I don't need a word to tell me what my life is like what that embodiment feels like I agree that there was yeah. no that there is no structure to disability in the same way that there is a political structure today with with the politics of disablement with the social model like we discussed a lot earlier mm-hmm. but that does not mean that disability did not exist that's far too sweeping a statement of course it existed mm-hmm. of, course. Uh, of course it existed it's always <laughs> existed and it will always exist and it, it just yeah. changes the nature of it changes both in terms of its embodiment but also in terms of how our relationships go with other people in 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 mm-hmm. some ways i don't think you could ever say that greece was wholly positive or wholly negative towards it in the same way I don't mm-hmm. think you could say any society ever has been or will be. Uh, it is just mm-hmm. the way the way things are. Humans are complicated like that. You know, far too far too often, you know, people try and find those absolute answers and there really never is one. And I think if we just mm-hmm. accepted that we might be a little bit more not only a bit more content with the with the, with that reality, but also open up our minds to being able to see how much more complicated and multifaceted the ancient world was, just like it is today. Completely true. Yeah, it's interesting to me how much that connects with so many of the things I talk about. Um, but so explicitly, like, you know, the, I don't want to lessen anything. So, you mm-hmm. know, and please be perfectly honest with me if if, if what I say does at mm-hmm. all, um, because I think this is a really important topic. But I think that just looking at it the way that like people um, treat uh, women mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. like assault and things, it, it's so similar in the way that People like to think that because uh, because women, you know, were or the, they, certainly women were property and all of this, mm. but that because you know all the gods were you know assaulting all the time, that that somehow that meant it wasn't bad. Or mm. you know the 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 thing that comes up for me so often is that like, well, given Hesiod as our oldest source for so many things, like if Hesiod didn't say it was assault, then it clearly wasn't <laughs> assault. And I'm like, that's so fucking yeah. wild. And also. B- betrays a complete lack of understanding of Hesiod as a person um, because he has made his, his views on women very clear mm. and thus would have never cared to mm. say whether or not it, it was assault. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can't obviously look at something and, and you know, say that objectively it probably mm. was. Um, and so it's just so interesting the way that that the connection is made to, you know, negating mm. that these things ever even were a thing back then in the same way that you're mm. saying, you know, this idea that, disability wasn't a concept Mm. back then and it's like just because that we have changed the way we have understood these Mm. things and have better terminology and and you know ways of of verbalizing what what we're talking Mm. about and understanding and and all these things it doesn't mean that it wasn't just as you know important Mm. and 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 like and valid Mm. back then it's just that everything you know the the way we understand these things changes based on the world around Mm us um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's such an interesting way to, I just think it's so relevant to, to everything I talk about in my podcast. So many connections to be made there in terms of mm. the way that we view these things, the way that pop culture views, views mythology and, and that disabled people in mythology, but so, you know, obviously the, the connection is so explicit to, to Hephaestus and, 
and the way that I mean this this connects to the the last thing that I had mm-hmm. to that I wanted to get your thoughts on and and also bring up um is you know we were talking about reception mm-hmm. earlier of of pop culture reception mm-hmm. and you know lack of or the way that Hephaestus is turned into this like monstrosity Mm. you know this like almost inhuman Mm. looking person in a way that the olympians are so very human in their in their appearances Mm. and so so two um depictions of hephaestus come to mind and Mm. and very different and so i wanted to know whether you've heard you've seen them and also your Mm -hmm. thoughts so first um have you ever a lot of people didn't don't know that disney's hercules Mm -hmm. they made a tv show after i did know that there was one but i haven't seen it because i don't think it was really aired in the uk fair yeah i feel like it it definitely like is not a thing Mm -hmm. that most people know Mm of um i happen to be the perfect age (laughs) to have watched it and also in canada so it was ideal um but i'm going to going to send you a picture of a bunch of the gods yes and I find this, I mean, you know, it's very 1990s, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I find it so fascinating. So Hephaestus in Disney's Hercules, the TV show, I don't think he's in the movie. No, I don't think he ever appears from what I remember. Yeah. Um, so he's this like big buff, clearly meant to be very good looking mm. man working at his forge in a lot of episodes. And he is, he is, yeah, in- incredibly, you know, very jacked, like strong man. And I, I don't think that he is depicted as having any sort of visible disability, whether they meant to mm. like fully erase it or not. I mean, certainly if that was the case, mm. it's not ideal. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but, and then Ares is, is this like, it basically he's like the polar opposite of Hephaestus mm. in a way that you don't expect yeah. based on knowledge of the myth and, and past representations, mm. I would say. And I think that's partially because they have Ares, they have Aphrodite very happily you mm. know, with Hephaestus and not with Ares. Um, but I think it's very interesting that decision because it's very counter to mm-hmm. what you see a lot of Hephaestus. And, and then there's also, and sort of the complete, I would say, like near opposite of that is, have you seen the very recent um, depiction of Hephaestus in Lore Olympus, the webtoon? I have only just started reading Lore Olympus, and I haven't got anywhere near Hephaestus's appearance yet, and I was hoping that he would appear, so I'm glad to hear that he does. <laughs> Are you comfortable with a spoiler? Go ahead. I, it's probably going to be a long time before I get there anyway, so please. He only came, yeah, he only came in the last few months. Yeah. Oh hello, that's awesome. Yeah, that the blade, the blade. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah. So, so to describe him, so Hephaestus in in Lore Olympus, it has. Um, I don't know the like. It, it's prosthetic, like, yeah, but it's not. It's, um, is, what is their word? They're for it, running. You know? They're running blades. That's not the official term okay. for them, but they are like. If you've ever watched the Paralympics, um, they they mm-hmm. are running blades. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he he has those, and he has a golden mm-hmm. arm or like bronze or something. And he, in the in the actual like you know story, mm. he's very he doesn't want anything to do with the Olympic Olympians. They like need something mm. from him, and he's kind of like okay. And he's very like quiet and calm and stayed and just sort of he's just like this brilliant man who kind of like works. Mm. I think he has like some people with him, so he's not alone, mm. but he's also not connected with the drama mm-hmm. of Laura Olympus. And I loved it. <laughs> like I, you know, it, Rachel Smith and I are like. Mm-hmm. It, we're like we're twitter mutuals we have dms yeah. <laughs> now and then and and i uh, had i messaged her immediately and i was like oh my god i like just love this depiction of Hephaestus. Mm. i think it does so much for the character mm. and so much for representation mm. and like she just handled it yeah beautifully well mm. and i think you know it, i think it's it, it was the perfect way of not remotely erasing his Mm. disability and instead making it like his kind of strength Mm. and making him like she completely took away his anger Mm. took away there's no there there's no real relationship Mm. with i think is clear from the rest of the comic that there's no relationship with aphrodite Mm. he's just like on his own and i think she just basically turned hephaestus into like a real person Mm -hmm. in a way that he is often not Mm -hmm. you know he he's not defined by his bad relationships with others. Mm-hmm. He's not defined by his anger. He's just defined by his skills in mm-hmm, craftsmanship mm-hmm. and his just like his overall talents. Mm. And I think that that's fascinating. I, I loved it. Oh, well, 
But yeah, I mean, those two right there are both really interesting for different reasons. First, with the Disney mm-hmm. Hercules one, I think obviously there's probably a good chance the reason why they, they just have him happily with Aphrodite and all the rest of it. And he clearly looks like a really happy chappy. He's clearly like, you know... yeah. He's a, <laughs> He's a good guy. He's just good old Uncle Hephaestus. He don't he don't mind. Um, obviously, because you know, getting into the nuances of of his of his relationship with Aphrodite would be far too much for a kids' TV show. Um, yeah, it's I, not I Disney. Also, uh, yeah, it's, it's just not very Disney. At least not Disney at that time. <laughs> I mean, Disney today mm. they love to push the true, but of course they're just, true. You know, the, the mouse has to make money somehow. So, in all seriousness. I, I do like, I, I find the character design quite interesting. I mean, to me, mm. the way I did read the embodiment of Hephaestus, the way he's described, I do imagine him as quite a big dude. Like, I do, the way mm. I read it is like, he is quite muscular. And I, I would not be surprised if in some way he was at least equal to, if in not in some ways, surpassing Ares and the other gods. Like, I mean, I mm. think, um, obviously... Um, his de- Ares depiction there is also again Disney's very child friendly way. You can't really just depict war in all its in all its extremities. I think obviously from I remember from the movie Ares is obviously this very cantankerous sort of like you know he just goes charging in sort of thing. But that's it. Like it doesn't he doesn't really embody that too much. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think um, for me the 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 kind of the larger size of Festus to me as a disabled man like just kind of feels right just because like. If you've ever looked at a disabled person in general, they actually have quite more strength than people ever sort of realize, both on the inside and out. Like, you know, mm-hmm. it is it is just the nature of who we are. We are very strong people. Um, and so I, I like that. I like I think that's a nice touch. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think showing show, showing him happy is, is nice. Um, but I think you said, you know, they don't really touch on the disability aspect of it at all. Like it just, just does, doesn't appear. I don't think so. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I don't think which, so. Uh, yeah. Which, uh, in, a, in a sense, is obviously a drawback. I think obviously taking that away, mm-hmm. and that's not anything new to depictions of Hephaestus whenever he does appear in very brief kind of... It always seems to be. I've yet to see, obviously with the exception of what you've just told me, I've yet to see mm-hmm. a depiction of, of Hephaestus in like TV or movies, at least, that ever kind of gives him more than maybe a few seconds on screen. Like he never really mm-hmm. seems to appear for very long, and there's never really a role for him. And I get that in a lot of the myths that he's in, he's never really that big of a player. But I would kind of like to see more of him in these sorts of ways. So going on to Lore Olympus, mm-hmm. I find the decisions mm-hmm. of Lore Olympus really interesting, and I think, as you mm-hmm. said, that is mostly to its benefit for sure. Like the idea of like kind of taking away all these things that we often associate with him and and humanizing him in this way in a way that we can relate to him a little bit more but also just fundamentally to see him for what he really is which is just a crafter who is just very good at what he does and he's just kind of Mm -hmm. on the periphery of these things mostly by his own choice at this point i mean from Mm -hmm. the way i mean obviously i'm very new to lore olympus i only just really started but already what i kind of see in it is that it's almost as if all of the stories that we know have already played out. So at this point, it's just it is just kind of, it is obviously a retelling of the whole Persephone story in 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 some mm-hmm. respect. But fundamentally, the rest of it is already history to them. They're already just they're, the, mm-hmm. the gods are just living their lives. So in in to me, from the sounds of it, Hephaestus has already done all this bullshit and is like he's already done with it all. So he. Like I don't know whether that's ever something they that they plan to touch on, maybe whether they do intend to revisit his relationship with anger at any point. Because I would like to see that. I do, like I said throughout this entire talk, I do think it's important. But that's not a criticism because I do think there is a value mm-hmm. in taking that away from the beginning and just being like, look, this is just who he is. This is this mm-hmm. is what he does. I do find the, the the use of blades quite interesting, and I think obviously that ties in with technology and the fact that he has created his own mm-hmm. aids and stuff. Generally, um, truth be told, um, with disability, mm. I prefer to see the embodiments reflected as is. But that doesn't mean I dislike the mm. the portrayal at all. They're, just to be clear, mm-hmm. it's still a very beautifully drawn portrayal, and I like the the design choices behind that. But um, I, I would also like to see a portrayal of Hephaestus that is just him with his club foot. Like that would, mm-hmm. to me, that would be important and it would be valuable because it would it would do a lot, I think, to kind of dispel this kind of this 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 sometimes societal view we have of of any mal even just a, a brief sign of physical difference making all this making all this um kind of difference to the person if that makes sense whereas obviously mm-hmm. it's it's far more complex than that i would just like to see that mm-hmm. but again not saying yeah. i dislike it it's it's still really really good and i like it and he looks very 
I like his kind of very quiet and contemplative expression. And I mean, yeah. you can still see, like, in just like, he, you can see that there is some fire in him in the, in that sense. Like, I like mm-hmm. I like his his eyes. His eyes have that kind of fiery glare to them, but he's not intimidating. Mm-hmm. The blue, I like the blue because the blue kind of gives that more kind of chilled sort of sort of tranquil, that peace sort of vibe, and I like that. Mm. And that, that's kind of a good juxtaposition because I, I, in that sense, again, I haven't got anywhere near it in the story yet, so this is just me mm. going off just looking at the character design. But if we are going with this idea that you know he's just rejected the drama, this is maybe him just kind of saying you know this is what I want to be, this is the the chill out sort of chill person I want to be, and he's he's taken the steps mm-hmm. to make sure he is that. So in a way, he's taken the steps to be a better person than maybe he was in the past at some point which again mm-hmm. she may never plan to touch on it and that's certainly fine if she chooses not to and chooses to take it in a different direction that's her artistic license and i mean from what i've seen of it so far it's great but um you know i i if if she does decide to touch on it that would be really cool mm-hmm. as well i think to kind of mm-hmm. look at this and and that's the other thing as well as like this this as i said earlier if there are any people like listening who who really want to do a modern uh, kind of retelling of Hephaestus or kind of mm-hmm. characterization of Hephaestus. Um, I get asked this, I actually got asked this recently in a discussion about Hephaestus. It wasn't about him specifically, but it was about disabled characters. You know, can, I think the question was something along the lines of, can I have the disabled character be the villain or or at least, you know, be a bad person? And it's like, of course you can. Anyone can be a good or a bad character or anywhere in between. The important thing is that the disability is again it's an embodiment it's not the sole definitive reason for whether they are good or bad and it's not something Mm -hmm. that defines them solely because of it or in spite of it don't don't frame it as Mm -hmm. that it is just part of who they are and if you're if you really want to i I would say that if you are especially a non-disabled person doing this talk to disabled people read disabled people Mm -hmm. you know don't don't expect you know, if you want to learn more, you need to be willing to get out there yourself and learn it and to take it in. There's so much great disability literature. I mean, even just a more modern recent book you could read, for instance, is Disability Visibility, which is a book edited by Alice Wong. Um, it's a it's a book that's very North American centric, but that's by its nature because it's a book celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act but it is a very Mm. good cross-section of various disabilities and other embodiments trans black um other um minorities so on and so forth all these embodiments that kind of cross uh North America society who kind of write about their experiences with disability and it just gives you a, a slice just a just an understanding of just how multifaceted it is but I would encourage you to go further than that and to find these authors and to follow them and to read them and to to really understand them and 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 you know and to really kind of get a sense of what disability really means which is that it's it's far more than just the the kind of what you see on the surface or what you imagine even is going on underneath if you're thinking about invisible disabilities like like uh, chronic uh, pain or or even mental health it's 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 far more multifaceted than that and from from the sounds of things with the law olympus uh, depiction of hephaestus it has all the potential to really kind of go into those areas and to show how mm-hmm. multifaceted it is and I, I think most of all for me obviously i'm saying this as a disabled man but i would want any depiction of hephaestus to include it and to and to give it its due diligence in a way that sees it as part of what he is, not the sole definitive reason or has nothing to do mm-hmm. with what he is. Like, you know, I, I want it to kind of mm-hmm. be part of who he is, but not the sole thing of what he is, if that makes sense. You mm-hmm. know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a key, a key piece because mm-hmm. it, it is who he is, but it doesn't have to be why, you know, why he is, why he is or why he isn't, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It, mm-hmm. It's just part of it. Mm-hmm. And interesting. I'm, I'm trying to remember what, I've completely forgotten kind of what role he plays in Lower Olympus. It was subtle. It was not yeah. big. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what more she does. But I also think, you know, and not to turn this into Lower Olympus, but just one <laughs> final statement on it. But I, I uh, what I like about her story mm. and specifically because of the Hades and Persephone aspect is that it is more about um, rewriting mm. the myths than retelling them about completely removing the parts that don't work for the story that she wants to tell versus trying to work around them for me that's important because like i can't read versions of hades and persephone where they're they have retold the story to make the abduction okay Mm. versus yeah what rachel is doing is taking that all out Mm -hmm. 
completely removing all the pieces of mm. it and just telling a story about these two mm. characters. And that's what I like. And so, yeah, when mm. it comes to Hephaestus, I think it's more of like, he's just, he's a separate, I mean, mm. he's Hephaestus, but he is sort of separated from the things that we know mm. of. I mean, not necessarily all of yeah. them, but separated from, I think, it's, I mean, some of mm. those, some of those pieces that would, that would contribute mm. there. I mean, I think separated from the, the Aphrodite mm-hmm, pieces, mm-hmm. which, you know, are sort of his most uh, problematic aspects, mm-hmm. you know, for, for whatever mm-hmm. reasons, like related or unrelated, mm. but yeah, it, it's just an interesting, an interesting thing. Oh my gosh. I mean, obviously this was great because it's two and a half hours. It's going to be <laughs> probably officially my first two part conversation episode. I mean, honestly, thank you no, so much. Thank you, thank you <laughs> for giving me this platform, for giving me the time just to talk about loads of different things, but I'm very excited. It's been absolutely lovely to talk to you. As soon as I heard that you were interested, I was like, yes, this is going to be great. Thank you. Yeah. This is, this has been absolutely amazing. Oh my gosh, thank you always for listening. It's such a thrill that I get to do this. I will say that every time. Apparently, I've got to get some new material, but it just keeps being true. I'm just so grateful for the people who will have these conversations for me with me, for you all for wanting to hear them, for the episodes that get sparked out of those conversations. It's really just so much fun. So I hope you love this one as much as I loved recording it. And next week, we're diving into some of the, the original reasons for this podcast, the shitty heroes, because I think we need a little bit of a refresh of that classic, wild, and problematic and super fun Greek mythology. Ugh. Stay tuned. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm-hmm.